Okay. Rob, do you want to go first? <laughs> so you're not ready either. <laughs> well, my Why machine not? decided to reboot about 30 seconds before the meeting started, so I'm just reopening Windows. So who's recording? Uh, I can. Let me know when you want to start. You good to go? Oh, sorry. Oh, I already started it. <laughs> uh, it's recording? <laughs> Tricky. All right. Let's get the show on the road. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to do a, just a bit of a, a quick run through of some of the um, work we've been doing in the front end of Refactor. Just give everyone a bit of a look at um, sort of the progress we've made, um, where we're at design wise, um, and then at the end of this, probably off post record, uh, just to get a bit of feedback from everyone. Um, and anyone who's watching in YouTube, comment below and add your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've got a, uh, a permanent instance up and running, um, as you can see, and we, uh, I need to share it. Why can't you just see it? <laughs> I was busy talking to the, the screen. All right, how's that? Yeah. So, I've got the permanent, we've got the permanent um, instance up and running, just so I can show you, um, I suppose, the fact that we now have the external auth providers um, hooked into the new portal. Seems like a minor thing, but there's actually quite a bit of reworking that's going on under the hood to um, make them uh, more framework agnostic. So previously there was a bit of uh, dependencies on Angular and assumptions that were being made that it was Angular. Um, and so some of the guys have rewritten parts of that just to make it more, um, I suppose, dealing with sort of native JavaScript. Um, and that makes it a lot more agnostic as to the framework we use um, and less dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, all those auth um, pieces now work fine in the new portal. And I think they also work, thankfully, still in the old portal. Um, and obviously a little bit of work was done there to make sure it all syncs up fine. Um, so I will take you through some of these screens. So now we've, I'm not sure when the last time we demoed this, but we're actually getting data from the um, real API endpoints now. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've taken the repository that was in the old portal, kind of brought that across into the new portal, almost as is with a, with a few changes just to clean them up and consolidate a bit. Um, but then because we're using um, uh, TypeScript in here now, all of our actual resources, so all the models, um, we've got uh, TypeScript interfaces for. Um, at the moment, we're just script putting them together manually as we go, as we hit an API endpoint where we need to use them. Um, but I think the idea is that eventually we're going to look at generating them sort of either at compile time or, or on demand. Um, and that way we can keep it um, synced up with whatever the current version of Octopus is and um, yeah, there's less less pain in terms of generating them But using them is definitely a huge a huge bonus being able to use TypeScript for these um, resources um, I mean as you can imagine imagine trying to do the back-end code using models without any sort of type safety and everything being dynamic You can imagine how much um, safer it is being able to use resources everywhere. So when we pull down a list of tenants we know the type um, is a list of tenants that has a name and an ID and, and what have you. Um, one of the things we've found is that it does take a little, you do need to uh, take a little bit more thinking when um, using TypeScript because you've got to keep in mind TypeScript types is not the same as C sharp types. It's kind of a compile time safety thing. There's nothing really magic happening at runtime. Um, and there's obviously a few little nuances to, to that. Um, so I'll go back. <laughs> um, so one of the other pieces that uh, Pavel actually just added the past day or so is um, basically being able to handle unhandled exceptions or basically catch exceptions that are happening right down during the um, React lifecycle. Uh, previously, we'd have to wrap all of our um, lifecycle methods in try catches, which is both a a pain and b potentially unsafe because we're going to not wrap it with a try catch and something's gonna fail somewhere. So now there's a base component, which uh, the approach we've taken at the moment is that there's a base component um, and it wraps all those lifecycle methods with 
bit of an appropriate try catch um, so that we've got a sort of a global handler. Now, this isn't going to be majorly pretty, but just to kind of show how that works, I've now um, killed the server. Um, so obviously when I try to go somewhere, it's going to fail. So, okay, what did I kill? Oh, there we go. So I'd loaded this before, I think, and so it still had that in memory. But as you can see, the, um, the error was caught um, and has been uh, pushed up to the global level and we're sort of just showing that to, you, to the user. Um, we'll probably change the way that that gets surfaced and make it a little bit nicer and more user-friendly and blah, blah, blah. Um, but functionally, that, that layer is there now to help sort of protect um, errors coming through from the, loss, uh, from the React components. So I'll just refresh that. Um, so some work has been done on the dashboards now. Um, again, these, this is all obviously coming back from, with, with real data from the um, API endpoint. So these dashboards at the moment are built to look pretty much like what you've got and can see in the current old portal. Um, at some point we might want to um, sort of refresh them or change them around or, or whatever, but um, you've got the same concepts of, so this is a tenanted deployment. So obviously you can do grouping by tenant tags. So um, you can see grouping by tags. Um, we've got a um, the tenant designer. So again, this is another case of where we've taken the existing design, just brought it over directly as is um, unchanged into the new portal just to sort of, I suppose, speed things up um, because we want to rethink the way this design, uh, tenant designer works, because um, it has led to a bit of confusion from users as to what it, sort of what it means when you're selecting um, parts of this. Um, so if I then go, so I mean, again, this is probably something you've seen in the old portal. Um, uh, it's showing up. So it looks like there's something. I think some, there's a rendering issue here. I think because the screen now is so small, um, it's cutting off the results. So that's something I need to have a look at. Um, but in theory, it's, it is selecting things under the hood. As you can see, it's the preview saying it's matching the tenants. So let's pretend that it's showing them there at the bottom. Um, and then obviously, again, that applies that filter to the dashboard. Um, we've also got that for non tenanted areas. And again, you've got the um, the filter release, which just goes through the, the data set you've already got locally, and you've got grouping. Um, the, so I've tested this dashboard uh, rendering with the huge data set that we've um, got in a, one of the database backups floating around. Um, comparing with the old dashboard, now in the old dashboard, the way this um, was being rendered is effectively it would build this big HTML string and then just dump it into the DOM. Whereas now we're actually dealing with um, React elements and we're um, sort of processing the data and putting it in a shape we want. And then React is um, using the virtual DOM to um, basically decide what parts uh, of the screen actually need to be re-rendered. So there's a bit, of, there's sort of a trade-off both ways in that now, because React isn't uh, re-rendering the entire dashboard every time, we're saving a whole lot of time in terms of repainting. So there's a lot of repainting that's no longer going on. But to get it to that point, there's obviously a bit more um, actual JavaScript code, obviously, to build those objects and to process that data. So um, there's a bit of trade-offs back and forth. But overall, um, when I've hit with a large data set, it is definitely um, a, bit, a bit quicker, which is the main thing I think we can hope for with, with this dashboard. Um, a lot of the a lot of the improvements I think with this dashboard will also come from optimizing the queries and doing sort of more work on the back end. But front end wise, it's definitely a bit better. So the fact that it's not worse that's that's a thumbs up. <laughs> that's, exactly. that's the good thing. Um, so we've got the settings page. So uh, Mark has been working hard on um, setting up uh, the forms and getting form the, the whole way we deal with forms um, sort of standardized through the app. So to show an example of where we're using that is the project settings page. Um, so we've got this concept of kind of a read view. Um, so in, on the projects page, you can see here all those, all those different form elements that you would usually be scattered all over the page are sort of collapsed up so that they're easily viewable. 
Um, I think part of the benefit of this would be that um, if I've got view permissions but not edit permissions, it's fairly easy to sort of disable the ability to go in and actually edit the, the values themselves, but it still sort of looks consistent. Um, if you do want to edit them, um, you go expand it and you do your thing. So there's a, a bit of inline form validation as well going on. So if I take out the project name, obviously that's required. So we've got the, the inline client side validations going on. Um, that's not going to block me from sending, which probably should. But if we hit save now, we should get a, so this is that um, server uh, side error that's coming back. There has been a little bit of work done to sort of marry up the server side exception or server side error with actual form elements. Um, so that that way, even though we're returning sort of a fairly generic um, error response, from the portal front end, we can match that up with particular form elements. I'm not sure where that, that is, but I've seen it demoed, so it does exist, I believe. Um, so maybe that'll be demoed next time. Um, the other thing you might have noticed is as it was saving, so if you look at the, um, the top of this uh, paper element here, basically that's where we will show uh, a loading sort of throbber. So if I hit save, you'll, well, oh, that was pretty quick. Too quick. It might be hard to see, um, especially over um, Zoom as well, but believe me when I tell you <laughs> that there's, there's a, a small loading throbber that shows up on the paper element here when you hit save. Um, and that's kind of like that is loading uh, spinner that we've got in the old portal. Now that, that um, loading, I don't know what you call it, loading progress bar throbber thingy, that'll appear above the context of whatever it is that's loading. So in the case of loading the, the page as a whole, you'll see a loading bar throbber kind of at the top level, which tells you that everything down below is being loaded. Um, obviously you need data to render the sidebar, et cetera. But in this case, because, because we're already in the project area, we've got the sidebar. The only thing that's sort of reloading is the settings page. So the throbber kind of lives in that context. Um, and that kind of just makes it a little bit more clear as to, to what it is that's going on and where those changes are taking place. Uh, obviously we've got the dirty state that is hooked into the form, which is cool. Our releases page, we've added a little bit more um, information to that rather than just a list of numbers. Um, so it's an actual table now that can be um, sorted and filtered, etc., cetera, um, which is nice. Uh, what else have we got? So I think, I think as far as the project area is concerned, that's the main thing. Um, Jess will talk in a minute about some of our um, concepts for the variable editor. So feel free to um, get your opinions about variables ready during that session. Cause I'm sure you've all got something to say. Um, so I suppose the other thing then that I just wanted to mention is um, more behind the scenes here. What we've decided to do is um, we've taken out Redux, the use of Redux from most places. Um, we found that there's, there's a, a bit of boilerplate you need to set up um, when using Redux, hooking up the props and the um, dispatcher callbacks, etc. There's a lot of value you get from using Redux, um, but I think our where Redux solves them and that way we kind of use Redux because it's solving a problem as opposed to reading on a blog that Redux is great and so we should use Redux. Um, there are a few sort of uh, extra, um, yeah, it's quite a bit of extra boilerplate you need to, to set that up. So for the time being, we've kind of extracted most of the use of Redux. There's still a couple of places where there's global values that we want to be accessed throughout the app. But by and large, we're keeping states sort of localized when the component that's being used. Now, that's not to say that's necessarily the right approach. Um, but yeah, as I said, at, at this point in time, it kind of makes sense to keep it localized. Um, and then we can quite easily refactor and move some of that to, to Redux when we hit those points that make us think, geez, I, I, I've got this problem. The only way of solving it is to sort of go down that path. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that's kind of where we are with at the moment with the front end. Um, so we've started. Um, I should, so we've got uh, John will be starting out with our team, or he's starting with our team uh, this week. Uh, we're going through a bit of an onboarding process, and we're just going with one person joining the team for now, so we can kind of gauge um, how how clear the current patterns are that we've sort of come up with um, and how um, intuitive it is to sort of start using React. Um, and Pablo has been putting together a onboarding guide as well that just outlines some of the decisions that help us get to the point where we are now. Um, once John is kind of up to speed and, and you know, kicking goals, we'll start bringing in more people and more people. So yeah, at the moment we're at that point now where we can actually start bringing people on because while we haven't solved and found a, a sort of solution for every pattern and every approach. Um, I think we've sort of solidified a lot of, a lot of the, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's it at the moment. Was there anything else? I think that was where we are at the moment. Um, I'll leave questions, etc., till after this. So maybe once we've done with the TLDR, we'll, um, just keep the meeting going and, and have a few discussions from there. Cool. So I will, uh, hand over to, Jess, I suppose. Are you ready, Jess? Cool. Yes. Okay. So in our refactor team, we've been looking at the variable editor. Let me just go full screen. And we've done a first pass of um, what it might look like in the new 4.0 design and also trying to address a lot of those just simple issues that the users were having, like just tabbing in a logical order, making sure things delete properly, making sure you can select the cell properly and trying to give them a seamless table editing experience. So they're not jumping in and out of a modal. Um, but then there's always the option to go into the modal to edit. So I went through all of the user voice comments and I made a table and we sat down together and we, decide what was in and out. So we decided that anything that added new functionality to the table is out for this first round. Um, we just want to make it work properly, pretty much. Um, with the exception of a few things, there's a few little new functions that have slipped in there um, into the design. Whether they'll get done in the first round, that's still open. So um, if we have any feedback on the variable editor, maybe we'll just, yeah, talk about it at the end, um, but definitely this is just a uh, first cut. So let's start with what it would look like. So in the new 4.0 design, a lot of the uh, content sits in this paper element, as you can see, so it's all quite contained. Um, we've eliminated the tabs and put a drop down here. So if you drop down this section, it would go to You'd have the option to go to variable templates for your project. You'd have common variable templates and your variable sets plus a show all for that view only mode that we currently have. Um, you'll notice here we have a filter. It's a bit more accessible than our previous filter that was kind of hidden by just one icon. This will be open by default. It'll also give our users a bit of a design preview so they can see what variables have been used for what scope. Um, and see if there's anything missing or if there's any double ups as well. Um, so that can be toggled on and off by this little icon here. And we'll also display some errors so you can filter and only see these errors um, as well. So if there's any missing values or if there's a new environment that's been added and it doesn't have a value, uh, we might have the smarts to be able to kind of indicate that, but also give the user the opportunity to dismiss that error or that warning if they don't want to give that particular environment a value. So the new table for our 4.0 is a lot cleaner than our previous one. Um, and we start by uh, giving this blank at empty add row at the top rather than at the bottom. So that if a user has lots of values, they can always see the empty row at the top as well. But let's go through 
um, a flow that a user might do. So let's say a user is editing a value, they hover over the, cell, the row, we go into edit, we indicate there's an edit state, so they click in this name cell, and as soon as they click into it, they can edit it. So type away, delete, whatever. They tab, there's a missing thing. So when they tab, they would actually tab over to this little comment icon, which is actually a new thing um, that some users have suggested that we add a description to our variables. So we thought that maybe it might be best to hide it, or not hide it, but put it behind this icon so that when you tab or you hover over it, then it shows the description. We felt like it was probably adding too much to the row if there was a description there. If we get feedback that, no, I want to see the description, then maybe we give them the option to be able to put that in the, in the table. Um, but the next logical place for a tab would actually be that icon and you would see the gray hover state there. Um, and then you would tab into the value cell for that particular variable. Um, so this one was empty. Um, so what we've got the option now to, back to front, to change the variable type within here. So you can actually arrow down, hit enter on change type, and you'll get your options. So you can either choose text sensitive or certificate from within here. So let's say we chose certificate, the drop down will then show the list of certificates. Um, so this is similar to what we show in like a step when we want to add a certificate to a step, we just show a drop down. Um, so we can do that here and we click enter on the certificate that we want and it puts it in that field. We tab over into scope. We go into, that doesn't feel right, tab. It should go directly into here. Sorry, these pages might be a little bit out of order. Um, it should go directly into this state where you can actually see all of your options. So you can tab through the roles, the targets and the steps, tab to your open editor link. Um, but if we wanted to start adding another environment, you can just start typing. And as you start typing, you'll get your little drop down box that will show you all your options. And you can arrow down in your drop down box. You can control enter to select multiple ones if you like, or just select one, enter, and it puts it into, into the environments field. To get out of here, you can either hit um, escape or you can go over to tab over to the X and close it down. Um, so that's the editing experience. So that's with all, all within this, the table itself. If the user wanted to edit the variable in the modal, they just go down to the open editor and they can do that at any time throughout the editing experience there. And escape kind of gets you out of that whole edit mode and puts the road back into its idle state. If we wanted to delete something, so at the moment we right click just on that first little cell that has the icon on it. So we've kind of flipped it over. The delete, reset and duplicate would be all at the end in this overflow menu that would appear on hover. And so you would either click on that overflow menu or while you're tabbing through the editing experience, you would end up on that overflow menu icon and you could click enter to show it arrow down to what you needed, delete, and it puts it into this deleted state as we have now. So not changing that. And once you hit save, that particular item will disappear. The add new variable experience um, is pretty much the same with a few exceptions. So this new uh, row at the top, you can click on any field and start adding a new variable. Alternatively, you can click on add new variable and it puts a new row underneath this. Um, so let's say we clicked in this field and we started typing. We tabbed, we started typing. We tabbed, we added a couple of environments. Done. So then we get to these extra, um, 
actions at the end of this new variable. So we can either add a new value. So this is bringing in that grouping concept. So you can have the same variable name, but you can have different values in different scoped uh, environments and, and tenant tag sets and targets and so forth. So if you hit enter on here, it brings down a new row and then you can just do the same, fill it out. Alternatively, you can just click add new variable or you can tab over to add new variable. It puts that new variable down and that empty row becomes active and your focus is in that first cell again. So just do the modal editor as well. So say a user wanted to use a modal editor to do this second value. They would arrow down to open editor they would click enter and they would come into this modal experience. Similar to what we have now. Um, it'll be nice and big on the screen, giving them enough room to put any code that they wanna do. This is where they've got the option to add that description. So the modal kind of gives us those extra uh, fields that we can define and with the prompt value, that's only in the modal as well. Um, So the actions at the bottom, you can either go done and return back to the table editor, or you can continue in the modal editor and define the scope. Oh, I'm missing a slide, that's okay. So the next one would be define scope. And once they've done, there is a button that says done and add another new variable or add a new variable it puts that variable that they've just created into the, into the table and it keeps them in modal editor mode, but back on that first screen um, so they can start putting in a new, a new variable. Um, hope that makes sense. I guess my slides are all wrong here. Um, and that's it. And you can see down the side, we have edit icons for things that you can edit ticks it uh, for variables that you've just added or say edited, and then the red X to show that you've deleted it as well. So it's kind of similar to what we already have, not changing that too much. Just making sure that everything's quite seamless in that table editing experience. Um, there's a few things that we haven't got on here yet that we've kind of spoken about and that's um, adding a variable by the scope first. So that will all be done in a modal editor rather than actually in the table because what we're thinking of doing is uh, maybe doing a split button here next to add new variable. There might be an arrow so you can have the option to like add many or add multiple values and that would open up the editor starting with scope first. Um, define your scope and then on the next modal it'll have the option to add in a number of values for that particular scope um, but that's still to be defined. Another thing that we've spoken about is if a person adds a new variable and it's got the same name as an existing variable in the table we might show some sort of prompt to say you know, this is the same as you've already got one name to this. Do you want to merge that together or group it together? Um, and we can automatically do that on save. We can group same named variables together. But we just need to work out how to communicate that uh, to the user that that's actually happening. Um, I think that was it. Um, I have a Google Doc which I'll put in um, announcements and I'll put this PDF up for anybody to look at as well um, if you just want to take the time to kind of digest it um, and then we can discuss it later if needed. Uh, good morning. So uh, since remote release promotions has been uh, temporarily paused I've moved over to work with Matt Kasperson on improving our story for those who live in a non.NET world because even heathens need octopus love. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, but it seemed like there was a, a bit of a pothole in our Linux happy path. Uh, 
and Mono be thy name. So thanks to the work of uh, Mr. Rydstrom and Wagner and co. We have a .NET Coreified Calamari sitting there. So it seemed a shame not to put it to some use. So let me just share my screen here. Can you folks see that? Yep. Lovely. Okay, so we have an SSH target here running Ubuntu. And if we look down the bottom here, we add a .NET section and you know, all the wording and labels around this can change, but the default is that a full .NET framework or mono is installed on the target. But if we opt to say mono is not installed, and then choose a platform. We can then check health. Which will tell us that it's not running the latest version of Calamari. And if you see here, what we're streaming now is no longer a, a .NET uh, framework dependent Calamari, but it's a fully self-contained platform specific Calamari, in this case, platform specific to Ubuntu 16. So then we can add a project. So we'll run a bash script here. Deploy to our Linux environment. And that runs totally sans uh, .NET installed on that machine. So that's obviously not particularly interesting running a bash script because you could do that anyway, even raw using the work rubber Res did. But now with the .NET core build of Calamari, we can add any other abilities that we want to that .NET core version of Calamari and let them run them without having Mono installed on the that Linux target. So, and that works for extracting packages. Now you can run scripts from within packages um, or with no dependencies on the machine. So that is that. So the outstanding questions with that, I guess become, um, is this the right approach that we want to take for for shipping a non.NET Core uh, version Calamari. And if it is, then how do we ship those platform specific Calamari packages? Uh, I've sp spoken to a few people about this uh, over the last few days. And I mean, one option is, obviously the default option would be to ship them in the server MSI install, but that would blow out the size of our Octopus server install. Um, the, other option is, is that we kind of assume that they have an internet connected Octopus server and it pulls those down on demand as it needs them. And you would also have the ability to cache them if you're running an offline Octopus server, similar to the way the community step template library works where you can cache them offline or they get downloaded behind the scenes automatically. Um, and I guess the, the other Thing, the problem that comes up is then discoverability. So how do we know what works and what doesn't work when you're using this? So 
obviously if you go and try and run a script there and you use well, actually it's not that obvious at all that's the problem if you try to create a script that tries to use c sharp script or f sharp for example it will fail because at the moment those are dependent on the full .NET framework version. And likewise, lots of our other built-in step types won't work. So I don't know if we say that's okay, or if we, at the moment it fails uh, hard and it fails late. So I think at the very least, we would probably want to make that, that fail a little earlier in the process, but, yeah, I'd love to hear uh, any thoughts that other others had on this. Or... Yeah, yeah, Michael. Um, with .NET Core two O, you may be able to ship just one zip package for all platforms, or at least all Linuxes. So, yeah, so there'll only be one package for all their um, Mac, Linux, and all that sort of thing. Rob, so does that work even for self-contained builds, so? though? Uh, more so, actually, because so for non-self-contained, you can already have one package, which is the portable one. But the platform specific, they've changed something in 2.0. I haven't looked into it yet, but they reckon they can, you can ship one, one zip file and it, by convention, kind of figures out where to, where to go down. Well, we, it'll, it'll have all the libso stuff in subfolders. Yep. Like platform specific. You still have that, how big it is, but... But, I mean, that would be really nice because that would mean it would be much more likely that we could just ship it with the uh, Octopus MSI install and it also would, I assume, remove the need to select that target platform like I had to there. Yeah, pro probably, yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Uh, we haven't tried it out yet, but... Yeah. <laughs> when it was a build, I, we asked them about it because that was the biggest thing, I, our biggest barrier. And they said, oh, we fixed it. Like, okay, cool. Yeah, so that would be nice. That would smooth the process even a little further. Um, although I think for the moment, selecting that platform there isn't the worst thing in the world either. If they've added a Linux target, they obviously know what it is. Um, you could always ship two MSIs, one which doesn't have them and one which does. So if someone doesn't mind, I don't know, 800 meg MSI, that's fine. At least it's self-contained, it works, they don't have to worry. They're not that big. They're they're 15 meg each, aren't they? They're about 30 megabytes. Well, you think about it, Team City is already 600 meg. Um, no one's got any qualms about downloading that. That's not the so. best comparison. <laughs> <laughs> going no, but but it's now. a server. How often are you going to download it? You're going to download it in office. You're going to be on fast internet. Um, it's a much better experience than trying to figure out um, uh, download it on demand for, a lot, for people who don't have the um, internet access. Yeah, you, you potentially download it weekly in the future, like every time we did a release. Yep. Mm. Yeah, something like that oh, would work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the other, I guess, interesting thing will be how far this approach gets us um, in terms of the Calamari solution. So we've kind of found in the past that we're sort of pushing up against the boundaries of the, the monolithic Calamari. So once uh, we start trying to add cross-platform uh, functionality to Calamari, we might find that that's the, the straw that breaks the camel's back to split Calamari yeah. up as well. Yeah, once, once we actually break up Calamari, I think that might make some of these sort of issues, like the issues you're talking about with things like F-sharp or, or whatever, or power, we're trying to run those PowerShell scripts on Linux, like some of that sort of stuff can go away. And even then, potentially, even for even for functionality that does exist on Linux, when you do a deployment, we can we can be uh, proactive about knowing what it is that that deployment involves, and just send the pieces that are involved for that particular deployment. Yeah, uh, there's, there's a whole lot of work we can do on that side of things to sort of optimize the process as well, on top of the stuff you're doing. Yep. And so I guess the question is, is for right now, for, for example, for the new sort of step types that uh, Matt is working on adding for the specific Java integrations, I feel like this is a better story than having to install Mono, being able to just go in, create a, yeah, choose your runtime platform and away you go. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any other thoughts on this, uh, I'd love to hear it offline, uh, ping this in Slack and, and tell us what you think. 
The other thing to maybe keep in mind is that it's looking like some of the, the Java integration is going to require Java calamari because they're going to tie into a lot of existing Java libraries. So I don't know if that's a that's going to be a consideration going forward. Do you, do you think that would be required? Because you could run them out of process. Yeah. Run them, how do you mean? Or whatever you need to run that is based on Java or, or runs on JVM, you can run it out of process from Calamari. Right, yeah. yeah. Potentially, yeah. I'm not sure how that would end up. But uh, I think that the, there's too much work involved in recreating some of the libraries that the Java tools use to make it worthwhile. But it's looking at this point like the, the tools and the, the Calamari themselves or, or whatever they end up being will have to be written in Java. I think that's fine. I think Manier will do that yeah. sort of approach where in the same way that Calamari currently executes out into PowerShell or Script CS when yeah. it needs to do that stuff. We can just pull that, pull that to that's exactly out of process. Uh, because rewriting Calamari in Java is in Java, I mean, it's possible. But, but, well, but that's, that's something we want to. You yeah. don't need to, you just need it to execute a different XE versus Calamari. It's kind of the same functionality except for Java. Yeah, and then the step that's, itself yeah. chooses, because yeah. it's all server side, the whole server side drives what's actually run, even on Tentacle. It never tells you to actually run Calamari itself. But Octopus doesn't know you're running Calamari, basically. Mm -hmm. That's great, Michael. I'm like, really happy that's that stuff's paid off now. We spent so long on that. <laughs> that was exactly right. I mean, all all the work for this had been done by by you guys, all the hard work, so it was, it was nice to be able to leverage it. I've had the test running against it for... <laughs> Probably a year now, <laughs> so it should be it should be stable. <laughs> is there any so uh, is there um, any value in allowing them to detect the um, platform from the health check? Because we send that stuff back in the health check. I'm just thinking if you've got a server and you update, let's say you run, you know, um, and update your platform rather than having to go through and update every, everything, all your targets in Octopus, just have it automatically go, ah, oh, I've done a health check, now just upgraded to 16.06, let's say, or whatever the next one will be of Ubuntu, and it just pushes the new one if that's needed. As, as like at phase two or phase three of, of what you've got there, I don't, uh, not to say that what you've got there isn't. isn't yeah, right. this, this was done just basically because it uh, will guaranteed work, I guess. Um, if yeah. we can come up with a, a solid approach for doing that, sure. Is there, a, yeah, I guess that's, we can talk about that offline, but I, I, can you detect what the platform is? Because those are .NET runtime identifiers, how you exactly map to those always. Yeah, I mean, like, when we do the health check, we get a whole lot of platform information back and there sh we should be able to do a one-to-one -one mapping between the, like you say, the .NET, um, uh, what do they call them? Alrighty. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I don't think that's something that's needed for, for what you've got at the moment. It's just a, a thought. Yep. And just uh, to make the obvious point, there's always the fallback for anyone that this doesn't work for or doesn't have one of the platforms supported. They can always fall back to Mono and the full .NET framework. So we're not taking anything away. And that's it. All being operative word then. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, knowing what I know about people who manage Linux servers, removing the need for a mono dependency is huge. Like that, that removes such a big roadblock to adoption. So, yeah, that work is um, is uh, is really good. Disappointingly, uh, the one thing that uh, yeah, it, it really disappointed me on this is that I actually did have to still run an apt get to install a package. Uh, Rob Wagner, you might know. Why? But I had to run install. What was it? Lib. Uh, LibSO. Yeah, LibSO. One of their stack unwind, whatever it is, libs on Ubuntu. Which I mean, when compared against installing Mono, is nothing. But. <laughs> and so, how would like as an end user, how would I know I'm missing something? Yeah, if that's going to be a long term thing that they have to do, I guess we just make that uh, clear and maybe catch the error that it throws and yeah, it, surface it, it nicely. Microsoft's got some doco on um, what's required to do it. it. It's all standard stuff. Like 
libgc kind of things that you need to install, which is not very unfamiliar on our Linux world. Yeah, yeah it was just, uh, the, I, I guess, a disappointing surprise because you think self-contained package, you think it's just going to run out of the box. Yeah, in, uh, in yeah, our project, we're already cool. checking for um, yeah. Bash and um, a few other things. So we can just add a check for that in the health check as well. So. Yeah, so that's, but that'll only be needed for the Ubuntu server, right? Not for the others? Uh, no, no, CentOS has the same. I think they all, all have the same. What about like BSD? Um, well, I imagine it's just a case of like if you've done a minimal install, you probably don't have that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, if it's a global thing, then we can put in the health check, but if it's something tied to a specific platform, that might not be. Perfect. It's different per platform, yes. Yeah. For example, we, we can do, we can detect the platform and then just detect the dependencies. Is and again, this is a v two, v three, v four thing. Um, how about running where the users have already done app get installed dot net? Like, if they just want to install it because they don't want to have to push it every time, or they've already got it, or whatever, are we thinking about? allowing or providing support for that? Why, I, I haven't currently, but why would you want that scenario rather than the self-contained one? What's the advantage? It's smaller. But you push it only once, and that's not on every deployment, I can imagine. Yeah? No, so you like push it only once, once exactly. Once. But it's once on Calamari updates. It, it should be reasonably easy though, because um, it's just to do another <coughs> package you have to include, just a dot .portable package. The executable is the same. Mm. Yeah, that's right. It's very easy to do. It was kind of almost uh, more work, I guess, not to do it in a way. But uh, yeah, if we think that's something that's worth supporting, we'll definitely, definitely add it. My only concern would be possibly the amount of support because of version mismatch. Like they have an old version or whatever. And well, this is my concern with this approach. It's kind of like we need to have built, if a new version of Ubuntu comes out tomorrow, and there's some sort of slight difference in the dependency chain that we need to do a new build of Calamari for, we need to keep on top of that. Whereas if we just go, it runs on .NET Core, and as long as we've got .NET Core installed, it's, it's yeah. like we don't make the requirement to, if we were to provide Python support, we're not going to say, oh, we're going to package Python up. We're going to go make sure you've got Python installed. But Rob, the difference is, is that, that the new version of Ubuntu will never change underneath them. They would have to go and create a new target and at that point, they'd have to choose the platform again, whereas the .NET well, framework... Saying, from our side, we would need to do a repackage, a rebuild of Calamari to include that new Ubuntu version. So if you include the portable, that means that Ubuntu 18, we don't have to go back and build all the old Calamaris for it. Correct. If you had Ubuntu 18, you just select the portable install.net on, on that machine, and it should just work. Um, whereas with... if we would have to, you would have to update everything, your server and the latest Calamari to support Ubuntu 18. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Which I don't so, think, I mean, again, I don't think that that would, I don't think what you've got there goes away. I'm just saying that then for some users that would make sense because, um, you know, that there's, I don't, I don't think it's a big problem to say you need this piece pre-installed. Just like we don't say to Windows, well, we don't say you need to you know, PowerShell, we don't bundle PowerShell other bits, we just assume that it's there. No, agreed. So on that drop down list where the options were full.NET framework or mono or no.NET framework, we just add another option in there saying .NET Core. I'd even just have it in the drop down as a portable. As a portable runtime identifier. Yeah, and in brackets requires .NET installed. Yep, something like that, yeah. But that'll work even for Normal target and normal tentacles as well, right? Thank you. Yeah. And this is the other, another good point is that whole .NET section that was shown on that UI there. At the moment, I've only added that to the SSH targets, but there's no reason that same couldn't be added to tentacles and to offline drops as well. Yeah, the offline drops is an interesting one, I think. But it would it's mostly... I, no, that's right. But if you chose the platform, I think it would just work in this case. Well assuming you're deploying to one machine. I mean, that's, that's I suppose, a, a better use case, a better scenario where the, um, the core kind of, uh, the portable would fill that, that gap. And, and I just realized that offline drops use PowerShell extensively, which isn't going to work so well. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. We've got, I'm sure we've got bash. Don't we pump out bash files as well? And you can run the startup as bash. 
I believe. There you go. If, that's, if that's true, then great. I feel like I feel like I added that, but I could be making it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the credit for that feature without knowing what it is. <laughs> Alrighty.